Well, good evening, everyone. How are you? Hello, good to see you. My name is Sarah Taylor Peck. I'm an MDiv 2007 graduate and this year's chairperson for the Alumni Council. We are so glad to be here in San Francisco. This is our first West Coast Divinity Dialogues. Yeah, that's something to celebrate. This is our alumni series that we've had in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in New York City, in Washington, DC, but we're so glad to be here in San Francisco tonight. And this is much to the thanks of an, another alumni council member, Phil Atkins Pattinson. Phil, will you stand so we can thank you? Yes. For donating the space and for paving the way, we thank you so much. Divinity Dialogues is a series that the council began in 2012. We've had eight of these events, and it's an opportunity for our diverse body of alumni to come together and to tell their stories about where they've been since graduation, what inspired them to go to the Divinity School, and how they're making an impact in the world. It's been a wonderful opportunity for us around the country, and we're especially glad to be here tonight. Back in the fall, we hope you tuned in. At HDS, we had our first Divinity Dialogues of the Year that I moderated. It featured two alumni who shared stories of healing. Tonight, we're continuing that theme of sharing stories, and this program is about stories of care. Caretaking, it's a powerful word and idea. It's certainly something that alumni of Harvard Divinity School focus on and bring to the world. Tonight we're honored to hear from two compassionate, curious, caretaking women. First, Sejal Patel, MTS 14. She is a writer, a criminal defense lawyer, and a former federal prosecutor. In 2008, Sejal litigated the exoneration of a Boston man who served 10 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. She'll tell us more about that story tonight. Her essays have been published in creative nonfiction in the Harvard Divinity Bulletin, the Champion Magazine, and other publications. I urge you to check out her blog, which is called Seven Almonds. Suzanne Skies is also with us. She's MTS 92. She works in international development as director of the Skies Family Foundation which supports innovative self-help programs in the U.S. and developing countries in education and job creation. She travels from schools to slums, prisons to farms, serving as a storyteller for nonprofit workers, social entrepreneurs, and their courageous clients who toil every day to end poverty and create equality. And she is also a blogger. I urge you to check out what she writes it can be found in her blog, Seeds of Hope, and also on the Huffington Post. So Sejal and Suzanne, welcome. Thank you for being here tonight. To start things off, we were hoping that each of you would share a little bit about your journey either to HDS or from HDS into your vocation today. Hello, everyone. It's so lovely to see you all here in the Bay Area, from Cambridge to here. Um, so I um, am a non-traditional HDS student because I am old. Um, I, had, I graduated from law school in 2000, and then I practiced law for 12 years. Um, and I had reached a point in my career um, in criminal defense where you either continue doing the cases you're doing or you start doing some really aggressive stuff. Um, and the last case that I litigated just before Divinity School was a terrorism case that was um, really difficult emotionally um, and also confusing in terms of what relationships mean um, from every single point of contact you can imagine between lawyers, judges, jury, the media, um, academics, um, and I really just needed to take a break. And so I uh, applied to policy school and divinity school. Um, back in 1997, I was actually going to quit law school and come to Harvard Divinity School. And my father and my wonderful husband, who's here, urged me to not give up on my dream of being a lawyer. And so I had the little pamphlet and I put it away, um, only to revisit it 17 years later. Um, and I was choosing between the Kennedy School and the Div School. And um, I went to the K School, which is a fabulous, wonderful place with a lot of 
energy and it was loud and it was networking but it was wonderful for that but I needed to be somewhere quiet um, and so I walked onto the Divinity School campus and there were all of these just wonderful kind people and my experience there for two years was just beautiful. It was really, I don't know if it was the contrast from law school where no knock on law school, but it's very different. Um, but every conversation that we had, you know, people would hold each other's hands or people would give hugs. And, um, and I had the great privilege of taking many classes with, with the three professors I studied with were very huggy huggy, I thought, anyway. <laughs> Michael Jackson and Diane Moore and then Helen Gaston were the three professors I studied the most closely with. And um, they just really helped me make a lot of sense of my job. Um, and I was just in a place where I needed to think about what I was doing. Um, I think in any career, you make a lot of micro-level decisions and then there's this uh, a habitual sort of a habit that develops in the way that you view your job and the way that you view the world. And for me, um, you stop questioning at at a certain moment, and especially in law or in appellate practice where there's such a rubric to how things are done, there's such a process, and there's winning and losing, it's very black and white. So you don't get many opportunities there to stop and ask questions, and I just read a lot in divinity school, and I read a lot of really hard stuff. Um, I think I, I was near tears the first couple of weeks because the reading load was very tough. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a mom, and I'm kind of old, and I can read cases, but I hadn't read Sartre. <laughs> ever and I really fought it hard but you know what at the end of those two years and I'm not Christian either and so making some sense of Christian ethics if you study democracy it's pretty critical that you understand that and I couldn't have been around more encouraged some of my fellow classmates are here and so encouraging and loving so that's how I ended up at HDS. Thank you. Hmm. So I was really happy when the folks at HDS asked me to speak to you this evening about storytelling because it's what I do. Um, aside from running a nonprofit and caring for my family, this is what I've been doing my whole life. And I have to tell you that I'm a writer, I'm an introvert. My process is that I go to write and then I boil it down and boil it down and boil it down. So I'm a little bit attached to my paper, so please forgive me. <laughs> I believe the greatest form of intimacy actually is sharing our stories. It's when we tell each other the stories of who we are that we reveal the layers below the surface and truly become close. So to get close with you tonight, I'd like to share the story of who I am and how my theology and storytelling came full circle when I met a man named Muhammad. It's a story of miracles and yet it's one that's just beginning. Back in Ohio, I grew up as the fifth of seven kids in a close-knit family. I learned that all humans are created equal, although we're not all born into equal opportunity circumstances, and that my fellow and sister humans are both my family and my responsibility. At the Skies Family Foundation, where I've worked for the last 11 years, we say that love is in our DNA, and that we believe in love and action, that every small act of kindness matters in a world where everyone is kin. So when I arrived at HDS in 1991, I had already tried and failed at a few jobs that I'd hoped could advance my love for humanity, including social work and teaching. I was in my 20s, living in Boston, working as a book editor for Houghton Mifflin. Getting into HDS was a dream come true because I could study world religions with students and, and professors who were actually from those traditions. I called HDS my little United Nations. And my two years I spent there were among the happiest times of my life. I'm guessing probably everybody in this room has that in common. <laughs> I went in as an agnostic, embittered ex-Catholic <laughs> and came out an optimistic interfaith journalist. In writing, which is for me the most natural and fulfilling work, I could marry my social justice values with creative expression. I was in awe of my advisor, Diana Eck, an expert in Hinduism in India. I had no idea my future life would take me to India many times to write stories from village huts to factories about ultra poor families getting a chance to go to school or to work a reliable job for the first time in their lives through the heroic efforts of our nonprofit partners. I took such courses as Buddhism and social change, the Holocaust and the genocide, 
and Jesus in the moral life. I was privileged to study with Dean Bill Graham, a humble genius who showed me how to look at all sides of Islam and life. I had no idea that after spending 10 years post-HDS as a part-time socio-theological journalist and a full-time mom, I'd later be able to launch my own nonprofit organization that provides advisory, capacity building, financial and communications assistance to innovative programs here in the US and around the world. Our mission is to end poverty through self-help, simply to provide opportunity to all humans to study and work, build a self-determined life. These last 11 years, I've been lucky enough to work with 29 family members including Christina, my niece who's here in the front row. Definitely meet her later. <laughs> I've traveled from a juvenile jail on the south side of Chicago to the Kibera slums in Nairobi, gathering stories from people who, because of unequal circumstances of birth, have had to strive against intergenerational poverty, abuse, addiction, lack of access to schools, job, health care, clean water and air, and food. My travel and my stories have taken me far beyond myself. When I'm interviewing someone for a story, everything else falls away. I forget that it's 100 degrees and that my head is aching and my stomach is empty. I forget that the photographer is trying to get his shot too. <laughs> I forget my name. All that exists for me is this person and their experience of life. Getting to hear and then transmit their stories is an immense privilege. I can't wait to tell you about Muhammad. This series is about storytelling, and we've asked both of our speakers tonight to share a story with us from the perspective of care. So would you share now? Yeah. So there's an article that's at your, your seat, and if you have a moment and a cup of tea and you'd like to read it, it gives you a fuller exposition of the, um, of the story, but those of you that are here can see a photograph um, that's up, and that photograph was taken by my dear friend, uh, documentary photographer, Brenda Bonsell. Um, and the woman in the front, um, her name is Ruth Johns. And Ruth here is obviously in church, and she's praying. And um, Brenda accompanied me um, as I was writing this article and just spent time with my client and his mother. Um, Ruth is about 80 years old in that picture. Um, it was taken about a year ago. So back in um, 2000, oh gosh, five, 2005, my husband and my fi then five-month-old daughter and I had just moved to Boston from here, San Francisco. And um, I was new to town, and I decided to start a solo practice uh, for fairly practical reasons. Um, I really love practicing law, and I feel um, it's my obligation to give, and I am in a position where I can do a job that pays garbage for the work that public defenders and prosecutors do around the world, but I can do that. Um, and so, I, and I really love working with the indigent population, but I also wanted to be around for my daughter, uh, and then daughters over time. So being solo was a really nice mix for me, and um, the public defender organization in Boston um, gives cases to private counsel that in all public defender organizations they do, and I had asked for wrongful conviction work um, because I had done it at Northwestern, which is where I went to law school. And you have to understand that we get lots and lots and lots of letters, and I have not ever met a client who um, ever agrees that he's guilty or she's guilty. So um, when people read about wrongful convictions, you often read about the success stories, but you don't read about the thousands of letters that come into the Innocence Project, to legal clinics around the world, to public defender organizations. And it's really hard to know which of these actually have heft. And more importantly, whether they're persuasive or not, is there any evidence, especially for old cases? Um, and this can be also very frustrating because science has evolved and things that we can do now, like DNA testing or arson testing, weren't things that were available for convictions that were in the 1990s, for example. So Guy, um, who's my client, whose photograph is at the front of the article that you have, um, had been convicted of by a guilty plea, which is an important fact, um, he took something called a NOLO, which is, I agree that you, that you have the evidence to say I committed this crime, but I don't agree that I committed the crime. Um, he was schizophrenic. He was homeless at the time. Um, he had a public defender appointed to him when he was arrested, who was a known person in the Boston criminal courts, 
Um, bless his heart, the man must have litigated, I don't know, three, four hundred cases a year. And that's how you make a living as a public defender. You got to turn out the cases and you got to turn them out fast so that you can bill and you can make, I don't know, a quarter, a fifth, an eighth of what you would make in private sector salaries. So I don't blame him. I don't blame people generally. So you won't find that kind of dialogue for me, but he really missed the ball on this one. Um, Guy is clearly schizophrenic. It does not take a mental health professional to know that. Um, but in the court evaluation, the um, person who did the evaluation spent about 10 minutes with him and said that he's competent to stand trial. Um, and schizophrenia, as many of you may or may not know, is also a cyclical disease, which means that it presents and then it doesn't. So even if someone does present as competent at a given moment of time, that doesn't mean that they are going to be a day from now or at the time of crime, more importantly, they were or were not. So he's found um, competent, which means he's able to take that plea, and he took it, and the judge must have told him on the record, you know, you're not going to get, or his lawyer, you're not getting any jail time. Um, and he had never gotten jail time for anything. He did things that homeless people do, theft, petty burglary, things like that, but nothing that he had ever hurt anybody else. The crime was the molestation of a child. About the worst, um, worst kind of crime, I think, that I've ever worked on anyway. So much so that I don't take those cases anymore. Um, and I, God bless the people that do because it's very hard work to do. Um, but it's also completely unsympathetic. So he took the plea and then he goes out on probation. And what do you think happens to a person who's homeless and schizophrenic who goes out on probation? Just about the first appointment, he doesn't show up and or he's been drinking. So then he gets locked up for 10 years. Um, and those 10 years were spent shuttling between Bridgewater State Prison and then facilities around the Massachusetts area. And Bridgewater um, back then was an interesting place. There's a documentary that I found in the Harvard archives um, that for the first time a filmmaker was able to go into a prison violating all kinds of rules, so I don't know how he got in there. Um, I shut myself in a room and did not let my husband or my daughters come in, and it's a good thing because of what I saw on that documentary. Um, and that was about 15 years before and had been reformed, but it's not a place that was staffed or equipped to handle a whole bunch of extremely mentally ill patients. Um, but as the disease seemed to get better, or they had put them on the right medication protocol, they would take them to, they would move them to another prison, and then they would get bad, and then they would move them back. So that was his 10 years. And then when he came out, he was what was called a registered sex offender. And in Massachusetts, there were three levels, levels one, two, and three, and three is the most aggressive, and he was a level three. So he lived with his mom, who was by then in her 70s. Um, and I asked his mom later, how did he ever get homeless? I mean, you're clearly such an attentive and lovely parent, and you care about your son. And she said, well, you don't really control what happens to kids when they get older. And as a mom myself, with young kids, I never thought about, wait, your kids actually do become adults, and they actually start to make decisions at some point. <laughs> and you can't control what they do anymore. And that was kind of the case with them. So he doesn't show up one night. She gets worried. He gets arrested. He's in jail. When he comes out, the whole time he maintains his innocence. He tells everyone, and it's in the records all over, I mean, hundreds of pages of records where he's telling every mental health professional, I didn't do it, but then so do so many other people. So there's always an issue of how much do you believe anybody. Um, he was assigned, I think, 13 lawyers or so before me. Um, and I was just, my, my husband's an HBS grad, which, and I just say that as code for, I have time to spend on cases. And so <laughs> I was just very lucky, you know, thank my husband for being in finance because I was very lucky that I can actually say, take so much time to find all these things and deal with really frustrating people who don't get you records. You just need 30 pages of a record and they won't give it to you and they won't apologize for it. So finally we got it all together and the prosecutor agreed, which is very unusual, and I don't know that there is another exoneration where I've ever heard that the prosecutor has agreed that they made a mistake. Um, and the cause of it was, in the early 1990s, the Boston Police Department was especially um, cracking down on just arresting people and pushing through convictions. Um, so we, the exoneration happened in 2008. Um, it was a really sweet moment, as you can imagine, but also kind of heartbreaking. Um, and after the exoneration, his life had to go on, and that's a hard thing. Um, not having identification, not knowing what to do with public benefits that you need, um, not figuring out how are you gonna, where are you going to live, um, you know, who's going to take care of you as you're getting older and you have schizophrenia and diabetes and heart condition, 
what else, whatever else. And his caretaker is this sweet lady who is the most kindest, <laughs> the most, and when I asked her how was, you know, I, she would say, how are you doing? And I would say, oh, it's okay, I'm okay, I'm having a tough day. And she's like, I'm great because God's with me. And it was, she's just the most wonderful person ever. So that is the story of Guy Randolph and Ruth Johns, two real heroes. Um, and I think they know it now because they've gotten a lot of recognition and as, they, as well they should. But this woman in particular is really a hero. And often in many of my cases, actually, it's the mother's um, parents at large, but the mothers who I tend to really have a lot of respect for because it's very hard to be related to somebody who's going through something like this, to be that support beam. Thank you. Sachel is such an eloquent speaker, and she's just as eloquent as a writer. And believe me, this uh, article that you have, it's, it's, you can't put it down. <laughs> um, Sweet. And one of the things I notice about your story that we have in common is the circle of connectivity between all the people who contributed to the story of Guy, right? So Sanjay is a contributor, and mm -hmm. your sister, who's here to support you tonight, is a, is a contributor. And there's this huge network of care that holds up one person like like Rose. Um, for me, I ended up writing hundreds of stories of people overcoming poverty and injustice, and it led me to this man in the upper left corner of, of this slide, Muhammad, in Bangladesh, and my current book project, which is called My Job. Um, I met Muhammad through a chain of friends who led me to a free school for slum children, where Muhammad's two youngest kids are now enrolled. So to gather material for the sample chapter, a nonfiction book proposal for my job, I traveled to Dhaka last spring. I was already in India for two weeks, writing for our nonprofit job creation partner, Upaya Social Ventures. So Dhaka was a quick flight away from Delhi. Dhaka also happens to be dubbed the rickshaw capital of the world, with an estimated 500,000 men pulling bicycle rickshaws, and yes, they're all men, in a city of 15 million souls. My coworker Steve and Sachi introduced me to Adnan and Nadia, an American couple from Bangladesh who live in Seattle, who've dedicated their lives to technological crowdsourced solutions to po global poverty. So they then introduced me to Corvi, whom you see in the bottom left corner. And I don't know if you, in the back row if you can see the sign these kids are holding. It says, um, Corvi Rakshan, father of 1,400 kids, happy Father's Day. He's now up to 1,600, by the way. Um, I was surprised to learn that Corvi was born into considerable wealth, right in the same city where Muhammad struggles to earn even a dollar. Corvi attended law school at the University of London and then made a 180 degree turn from everything his family expected from him. He rented a small room in the slums and started Jago, a free school for orphans and street children. Corvi's now 29. His, he has a smile like sunlight. And when he walks into a classroom at Jago, all the children start chattering and grasping for his hand. His staff told me that he sleeps in a cot in the back room at the school and lives and breathes his work. He's built the school out, like I said, to reach over 1,600 students and has expanded into the countryside via remote learning. He's also launched several social enterprises to employ the parents of the Jago students. Now, on the day I was to meet and interview Muhammad for my book project, the young man in the bottom right-hand corner in the red shirt, Saqib, accompanied me from my hotel and stayed with me all day, serving as a translator. Saqib's 24, and he told me that he also grew up well-to-do and currently lives with his parents, runs a freelance media company, and donates about 40 hours a week to Jago as an unpaid volunteer. According to Saqib, this is just the culture of youth in Bangladesh. So up in the, let's see, so in that picture with Saqib is uh, Muhammad with two other Jago dads who also work as rickshaw pullers. These three men gave me three hours of their time, which is equal in lost revenue to about one family meal, just in order to share the stories of their lives with me. Top right-hand corner is the rickshaw that Muhammad rents. He's very proud of it. You can tell by the look on his face and the, the way he sort of stands tall. He's probably my height. I'm 5'2", by the way. Um, but rickshaw painting is an art form in Bangladesh. In the middle picture is the slum where uh, Muhammad lives with his family, his wife and seven children. It's just behind Jago. Jago was built there um, 
on purpose. And then, one, maybe my favorite picture, even though it's not high quality, is on the top left. That's Muhammad with his wife, Julika. So Muhammad's mother um, set them up in an arranged marriage, which he says turned into a love marriage, mm -hmm. a love match. They've been married 30 years. She is as pretty as her name, he told me. <laughs> Muhammad grew up in rural Bangladesh. His father divorced his mother and then died, leaving Muhammad, the only boy, as head of household, just as the Liberation War began with Pakistan. He was 10. His mother, as a Muslim woman in a very conservative community, literally could not leave the house to go to work. So Muhammad went to work as a laborer at a nearby farm. He'd work for 12 hours, and his salary at the end of the day was exactly one plate of rice with vegetables, which he would take home and share with his mother and sisters at night. Decades later, Muhammad is still starving. I pull the rickshaw for my next meal, he told me. If I don't ride, we don't eat. As I listened to Muhammad narrate the story of his life, I became convinced that no one could tell his story as well as he could. That set the stage for my job, which is a collection of first-person stories of real people at work in the US and around the world. I'm just in the process of gathering material. Muhammad ha actually happens to be the first person I interviewed, and I'm about 12 to 15 people in at this point. Um, what I hope for my job is I hope to secure a contract with a major book publisher. And I hope to see stories like Muhammad's in podcasts and videos broadcast out to massive audience for two reasons. To raise funds for job creation programs that can lift families like this out of poverty into the dignity of a decent wage. And to connect with real people like, to connect real people like Muhammad with you, his kin. Only through stories can we sense what it's really like to be a devout Muslim husband and father struggling to build a better life for his children on the dusty streets of Dhaka. Only through stories can we learn of the complete dedication of people like Saqib and Corvi, who take the privilege that they happen to be born into and extend it out to thousands of others. Through story, we come together as one. And that oneness is my religion. Thank you both so much for sharing those vivid stories. Tonight we're gathering around the theme of care and my next question for each of you is what does it mean to care for your neighbor? You know, obviously, Sage All, you couldn't take away the struggles of Guy or the hardship of Ruth, but you cared for them. And what does that mean in action? And also for you, Suzanne, you couldn't change Muhammad's wages from a plate of rice and vegetables at the end of the day, but you care, and so what does that mean in your vocation? Um, so I have to bring in my sister and brother into this dialogue. My sister is a pediatrician, and my brother is an emergency room doctor, and I'm very proud of them both. But I say that because it's uh, interesting how the three of our jobs intersect. Um, when we had had earlier conversations about this, I had said that one of the hardest things about, I think, being at least a criminal defense lawyer, but maybe a lawyer, a litigator, is you have to have boundaries to your care because you can't continue that job otherwise. It will eat you alive. It's the, the degree to which you inherit someone else's problem and the unfairness of it um, and that you're supposed to be their advocate, but there's a line. You have duties. The people I really admire, people like social workers or mental health workers who don't have those same boundaries. For me, at least, I know I'm litigating something and it's sort of inside of that, but you just start to care so much and it's so hard. This case was so, it feels like it's a victory. People read in the newspaper, what victories, yay, we exonerated somebody. But it's not. It's a huge mistake. And nobody is ever made to answer for the mis all the clerks and the judges and the prosecutors who made the mistakes that caused that wrongful conviction, are they all are immunized. So they're never made to answer for any of those mistakes. And so how can you not feel such anger that, am I, you're, are you the only person who cares? And of course, not within the criminal defense bar, you're not. You're around a bunch of other really, really big-hearted people who are doing that work for the love of the work. And I think that goes also holds true, certainly for my brother and sister, the things they see. If you were to bring those stories home with you, I mean, my sister works in the NICU sometimes, and the stories that she tells when she comes home, it's, those are hard things to sleep with, and, or friends of mine that are oncologists. 
very hard things to think about how does this make sense in the world? How is that fair? Um, and so I sort of think about care in terms of a porous boundary. And what Divinity School helped me do was figure out what the boundary was and how porous was I going to let it be. How much does it affect me? How much does it let me continue doing my work? And when do you have to just put your hand out and just say stop? I, I, that this, is, this is what I'm going to do for you because if it goes any further than that, I cannot continue representing more people who commit murders and rapes and arsons and terrorism crimes and whatever else. And those are very difficult, I think, things to negotiate and because caring is also caring for yourself. So where do you fall within that dialogue and then where is it vis-a-vis -vis others? This is a great question. And my answer is one word, listening. You know, I, as, as I've worked, I, I feel myself coming full circle. When I first took this job 11 years ago, the first book I picked up to learn about international development was Muhammad Yunus's well-known book called Banker to the Poor. And I can vividly, and that takes you back to Bangladesh, which is where he started Grameen Bank. And he talks about walking over homeless beggars every day and how he used to give a few coins. And he kept giving a few coins. And then after a while, he stopped. And he had to sort of, like what Sejal was saying, he had to sort of figure out where his boundaries were and realize that what he could do is go build a program to lift people out of poverty instead of continuing to address the symptoms of what was causing um, social inequity. And so I think about that a lot. And now what I'll do is give a protein bar or whatever I have with me. Um, and I work full time for people like Muhammad. You're right, Sarah, I can't go back and change. But here's what I can do with my storytelling. And it, it's been really interesting working with my family as I do and hoping that they become more and more engaged and hoping that all of us can actually work together is that I really feel that my job at the end of the day is to put the mic in front of you and listen and just be present. So that's why in this book what you'll hear are people telling stories in their own words. I'm just editing it. I'm just transmitting and hoping that through that you feel connected with people like Julika and Muhammad and Corby and his 1,600 children. Um, and that you feel empowered to do something small that's an act of kindness that matters. One more question. What would you say to other Harvard Divinity graduates who have a heart and a passion to also be engaged in vocations of care? What advice would you give or insight that you've learned from what you're doing now? I mean, how could I give them advice? They gave me the advice. <laughs> These are the nicest people. Um, I mean, I think the people who come to Divinity School just come with like an extra ventricle in their heart. <laughs> I really do, because they're so, they're so in tune with who they are, and they're so lovely, and they're so not afraid to be vulnerable. And I think that's, Suzanne and I were talking sort of offline about being vulnerable, and that it's OK to tell things about your life that feel bad or that you feel judged over. And that is probably one of the greatest things that came out of that experience for me, is to keep staying that way. And it's OK, go be weird. I mean, it's funny, they say that to kids. You know, I've got a 10 and a 7-year-old. And I'm like, you be weird. It's the weird people that succeed. You know? <laughs> and I feel like in divinity school, gosh, you could, you could, there, were, there was a monk riding around on a bike. Where do you see this? <laughs> you know, and like go be the monk on the bike. It's a great thing. And so, I mean, I would tell them really keep whatever it is that's in there that brought them there. Keep that as you get hardened or calcified with the things that happen in life because there's something very beautiful that would draw you to such a beautiful place. And, and that's what they taught me anyway. So, yeah, my one word here is probably um, to network. I feel like we're living on the threshold of a really exciting time in history because America needs to redefine who we are in the world and how we play with other countries and other cultures. And there's never been a better time to be a global citizen. And one of the things that Sejal and I were talking about that HDS has done for us is really open doors. So to get to meet all of you, and that's I, we were really excited about tonight because we just want to like meet a bunch of friends in the area that have similar values. 
but there's a whole network of co-alums, of professors, of people in your um, professional networks where I really think that it's through other people that we get the work done of making our dreams come true. And our dreams are often dreams of compassion and, and action, and they're just as viable as any other, as any MBA's dreams. <laughs> There's a lot of compassion there, too. <laughs> and you know, it's so true because it, it's all reliant on each other, right? I wouldn't be where I'm sitting if I hadn't been lucky with investments in, in tech in the 90s and the noughts. So I'm a product of capitalism as well. We all are. And some of the freedoms of this country where I got to grow up are all I'm trying to extend to others. And I think that we can tap on the strengths of what America is at the same time that we're shifting and becoming, I think, a little humbler and a little bit better of a team player on a global level, I hope. <laughs> well, you all have been listening and focusing, I'm sure. But now we'd like to open it up to all of you. Any questions that you have for either of our speakers? I There's can't help myself. <laughs> 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 Well, I, really, I listen to Serial, yeah. you know, the, you've all listened to Serial. Is he guilty? Is he innocent? Would you have taken that case as one of the innocent Great projects? Question. I don't know if he's innocent or guilty. I would have taken the case, yes, because every person is entitled to a strong defense, no matter what they did. That's what our Constitution says. That and is my Bible. Thank you. And Suzanne, are you like the new Studs Terkel? That's exactly what I'm working on. That's <laughs> such a great question. And you too have a handout for me. And one side of it talks about the book project, and the other side of it talks about our family business and what we're working on together across three generations. Um, but yeah, it's exactly working, but fast forward from 1973 to 2015 and go global. So each chapter will take a different occupation. Um, a rickshaw puller, for example, I contrast Muhammad with a girl, Nikki, 27-year-old that I met in Denver who drives a pedicab by choice with a bachelor's degree and with a little Gucci handbag slung on <laughs> her shoulder because she didn't want to work in a cubicle. Um, so, you know, you, you can see where place and culture and economics so shape our choices and our experience of work, and then how our jobs create our sense of identity. We're in this really interesting pivotal time, I think, where geography still matters when it comes to jobs and how we experience them. So it's really, it's, it's a, such a fun project. Thank you both for your stories, certainly appreciate it. I think it's very germane that we're talking about stories of care particularly on the actual day of Dr. King's birth. And so my question is, how do we care uh, when we're so anesthetized to violence, right? When we don't understand the other, whoever the other is. And so in both lines of work, particularly, Suzanne, as you were talking about how we identify with our jobs, how is it then when we are so ingrained in our work, whatever that is, that we get to a level of care particularly as it expands our particular communities? You know, what I would do with that is turn the question right back to you. And you and I could sit down for three hours and talk about your work and how this plays out in your work. Because um, I, I don't know how to answer the question, except to say that there's neuroscience behind what I do. Um, so I work with nonprofits and social enterprises and help them tell their stories. And what, what I've learned is that the brain lights up in ways when we share a story that it doesn't when we just present data. So I think the, the short answer is one at a time. We care about individuals, right? We care about Muhammad. We can't say, oh my gosh, there are 1.3 billion people on this planet that are still trying to survive in ultra poverty, which the World Bank measures as uh, earning less than $1.25 a day. I can't even fathom that, but I can get my brain around people one at a time and get to know them and care about the cause behind the narrative. Does that make sense? It does make sense. But I would follow up and say, how do you even, I'm sorry, how do you even get to that one individual when we are, and maybe it's not germane to the people in this room, but when we're so hesitant to step outside of our particular communities? 
You want to know how to get to Muhammad? Go to myjobstories.org. <laughs> Otherwise, there are people right in your own community that want you to hear them. There are people in your home that want you to hear them. To me, the most profound form of love is being present and knowing who the other is by as much as they're willing to share with you in any given moment as they change through time. And I think the one person, I completely drink from that water cooler too. I think that people get so um, bogged down by the idea of a macro problem we can't possibly solve, put the label on it, racism, prejudice, homophobia, we can't solve these things. But when you litigate like a single case, and maybe just maybe in the course of your career that makes it up to the Supreme Court, you just helped one person that helped a lot of people. Or you know, you're a physician helping with an, you know, an epidemic, or you're going into a community that no one's ever been to and you're doing ethnographic work or you're doing storytelling. Those single moments do have great impact. And then think of it from the opposite point of view. If you didn't do it, then there, you would never even have the chance of it. So I mean, I would say yes, within everyone's communities, I'm sure where all of us live, there are big brothers and big sisters. There is the opportunity to work in a soup kitchen. There is, there's so many ways to serve. And it's a wonderful thing when people actually you know, skip that soccer game or skip watching Homeland episodes on TV. I watch them. But it's nice to spend a little time doing that. It's good for us, too. It's not just about giving. It's actually also receiving. What other questions do you have? Well, thank you both very much for your stories and all your work. I, I don't know if you do this in um, my job, um, but what about women or people who don't have employment who are amazing at taking care of people and um, uh, weaving that together with you know different cultures, I'm thinking particularly of housewives, different cultures value yes. the work of women who don't have an institutional structure to say I'm employed and yet they are deeply committed and so in the west there is more of a model of you know your value is tied to your job um, and in other cultures where women who are spending their time doing the laundry and feeding the kids that that is much more highly valued mm -hmm. um, and so in the women's movement earlier but still there um, that somehow your worth is tied to your job as you know as if not having an employer is not as valuable. So that's, um, I'm just wondering how you work with that. I can almost read your name tag. Is Paula. it Paula? Mm -hmm. You had so many questions on your I'm face this entire hour. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too. Okay. Um, and you're right. Um, so there are a lot. You're, you're, now you're drinking my Kool Aid. Mm -hmm. This project brings forth so many questions about what is a job. Right, so I actually, I haven't interviewed these people yet, and maybe you know whom I should speak to, but I really want to do a chapter on um, stay-at-home parents. And I'd like to contrast a mom or grandma with like a dad or grandpa. So I want to see both sides of that in the US and elsewhere. Um, I also think there should be a chapter on chronically unemployed. Um, Studs Terkel did retired, um, because what happens to us after we retire? and what happens to our identity when we are unemployed for a long time or when other people are telling us what job we should do. You know, I've met people in, in, in Africa and in Asia where, um, you know, they're working four jobs. So which one do you, I just interviewed a man on Maui last month who is a Grammy award winning musician, but he self identifies as an organic farmer. So guess what? George is going in the farmer chapter. <laughs> He's got five Grammys. <laughs> he said, you know, I just do slack key guitar music to support my farming habit. So in the end, he gets to say, you know, it's sort of like our sexual identity or our politics or anything else is like, what do you call yourself? And um, so it raises all kinds of intriguing questions that are going to be coming out through the, through the blog that we're just about to start and then also through the book. I don't work with stay-at-home moms who don't, uh, if they are, they're doing something bad for the most part. <laughs> My general population, so I can't answer that question. <laughs> Ruth. Ruth worked. Ruth was a single mom. 
Yeah, she um, she got married in North Carolina in like 1950s, and her husband, um, after having three children with over like five years, he left her, and so she was a single mom living in Mattapan, um, and she worked actually at the Brigham and Women's Hospital for as a clerk um, for many many years, and then she retired in her 60s. Um, but the it was very stressful. I mean, she had three sons, the oldest of which is in the military. Um, in the State Department, and then the second uh, was a drug addict and died, and then the third, of course, was Guy. Um, so just listening to her struggles through how to be a single parent who's also a breadwinner, who's also trying to support your three children, one of whom, and, she, and it says in the um, article, she said, I didn't just support Gregory because he was the smartest. Um, and he was, he's really accomplished, you know, to be, he's been stationed in Afghanistan and Liberia, and, and then, you know, you have a kid who's a real problem child, and then the third who didn't know, she didn't know he had schizophrenia until he was incarcerated. So, you know, kids of that age look lazy. I mean, to her it was, he's lazy, he's shiftless. Um, her partner at the time wouldn't let Guy stay at their home because if you are going to live in my house, you're going to work. You're an adult, you're going to work. But they didn't know it was because he had an undiagnosed mental illness. Um, so, I mean, I think in my instance, my involvement with the families or women who would be in these positions is always, or as the peripheral um, person that's in my, I mean, my client is my primary, but you hear those and it's really hard. It's hard to hear of the sacrifice that they make and then the burden that they take on when a litigation ensues. We have time for just two more questions and here's the yeah, so I think this has kind of been touched upon a little bit, but um, how have you dealt with substantial disagreements with those with whom you're working, or if there are any, if if ever there arises some sort of misgiving or tension in the relationship? Is that that's for Sigil? I don't know if uh, to what extent it might apply to either. My whole job is about people fighting. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> um, Oh, gosh. You try to be proud of yourself at the end of every day that you have not done anything sneaky. <laughs> when some sneakiness is done upon you, you think about what would be fair to return the sneaky, to put your tail between your legs and just deal with the sneaky, or to be really mad and go to the media and tell the media about the sneaky. <laughs> it's very hard. Negotiating those relationships in a courtroom setting is very hard. And in, like in that terrorism trial in particular, um, you know, you're friends with these people offline. So, you know, you're, hanging, you're talking to the prosecutors when you're outside, but then they're doing things that you're really not happy with when you're inside the courtroom. You're friendly with the judge outside when he's not on the bench, but when he's on the bench, he's, you know, overruling all your objections. And for me, anyway, and I think I probably just have too much feeling, but it, it hurt my feelings on a simple <laughs> level. I thought we were friends, you know? <laughs> How could you do? I mean, the example I'll give you, and this is not anything that's secret, it was in all the newspapers because we were pissed about it, but two weeks before a trial, it's a terrorism trial, okay? Like, half the stuff is in Arabic in a religion that we didn't know anything about, and it's international. Um, we got, like, seven hard drives of evidence dumped on our doorstep which I'm sure that they had for a long time. And if those of you that know anything about computer forensics, it would take a lifetime to search one, let alone seven. I mean, you've got to get computer forensics people in there. You've got to get translators in there. It is very, you can't do keyword searches. It is so, you see I'm animated, you see? <laughs> and we went into court and I just thought, how could you? We're friends, aren't we friends? And I still do think that they were doing their best job. I, and I still to my dying day will say that prosecutor, I was a prosecutor, they worked so hard and they also work for a pittance. And they do it out of love of the country and out of a feeling of patriotism. And what does that mean vis-a-vis -vis what does the Sixth Amendment mean to a defense lawyer? I don't think any of these people are bad. I really don't. I, I really feel like they really believe that they are doing their duty. But there is so much fighting and so much disagreement that happens in the midst of that. And all you can do is feel that you are being your best ethicist. Mm, yeah. And I'm not a drinker, but you know. Seriously. I like him. I respect him. He's the, he's the um, Boston bomber prosecutor now, actually. He's doing a tough job. I really do. I have my hats off to him. It's, it's a tough job, but, you know, we agree to disagree, he and I. <laughs> so I kind of have two different ways of looking at this. As a storyteller, over 11 years, my, my writing style has really evolved from talking about people to letting them talk about themselves. And that's 
a, a shift that, that I've learned um, really matters. So when it comes to first person narrative, which we do a lot on our skis.org blog as well, um, everything's relative, right? Your viewpoint is your viewpoint. You guys could be on opposite ends of, of the building and you'd have two completely different perspectives. Um, so there isn't a lot of room for disagreement when you say, I am Suzanne and this is my experience, right? Now in the field of international development, you get a lot of disagreement. And I don't know if who, anybody, who's in the room that's working in international development? Michael, a few others? Any? Um, so what you get is disagreement about how to address entrenched social problems. Um, and for me, having been in this field for more than a decade, I just kind of ride the waves. Because what I see are lots of trends coming and going. So remember when microfinance was the thing. Um, and now I was telling Christina earlier, cash transfers are currently the thing. Um, there's always a, a silver bullet and there are people who flock over to this solution and that solution. And then meanwhile, I think what we've tried to do is just steadily invest in leadership in people that we know to be intelligent, compassionate, and flexible. Um, and invest in programs that are kind of coming at social problems from a little bit different angle in a way that's very client-centric. Um, you'll hear the word beneficiary used. I can't stand that word. These people are my clients. I work for them. At the end of the day, if they don't believe that what we're delivering is a valuable product or service, then I need to go home and redo the program, rewrite the program. So does that, is that even come close to what you were asking about? Okay. We have time for just one more question. Oh. I just, um, I wanted to thank you both just for excellent um, perspective on what uh, HDS has been for a lot of us, but I just wanted to ask, uh, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a physician, I'm in the caring field as well, and I wanted to ask both of you, what, what, what's the well that you go back to? What's the, the place in which you rejuvenate that compassion? Mm. Just because uh, you, you're talking about caring, but there's an element of compassion fatigue that's always a danger for anybody who's in this field because we become the vessels and the, the, the transmitters of these stories and not all of them end well. And uh, I just wanted to hear what, what are the things that you go back to, to both of you, that help you kind of stay rejuvenated, help you kind of keep that faith and that, that ability to keep going and to keep growing and expanding in the roles that you, each of you are doing? Let me take it first. You go. My mom and dad. And my book is about my parents. Um, and it was about after all of this, as you, what was the word you said, a wonderful phrase, compassion uh, fatigue. Com, com, yeah. That's wonderful. I've never heard that before, but the compassion fatigue. Um, when I was in divinity school the first year, I wrote about all these things that I got so animated about. And then my advisor, Michael Jackson, um, and I talked and I said, you know, I don't know much about my dad. And maybe I like care too much because I was born into a house of caring too much. And so I spent a year in Div school going back and retracing his life and many, many pockets of which he just had never told us about because he was very poor and things that he wasn't proud to share. And it was really wonderful experience. And then also my husband and my kids. I mean, for me, it's my family. Pe feeling supported. When you feel supported, you can support. So actually, that's why her work is also so important because I think even one person paying some attention to you and dignifying your story as being important makes that person feel strong to go out and do something better or better their own lives. You're empowering them just by, as Suzanne was saying, by listening to them. We didn't even talk about grant making, but that's actually one of the fields that we invest in is storytelling. So you know, we um, invest in folks that are, that are using storytelling as a healing tool and also as an empowerment tool. So it's really possible. Um, that is such a great question. You know, for me, it is my family. I have an amazing family that are, turned out to be some of the most generous human beings that I never knew until we started working together. And I started asking them, so what are you doing in your own communities in Charlotte, in Cincinnati, in San Francisco? Um, it's also the folks I work with, the nonprofit leaders that I get to meet are some of the most phenomenal human beings you would ever want to know. Um, they're, they're doing the work that I wasn't cut out to do. I can write about it or I can edit it, but I can't do it. 
It's just not my strength. But I'm talking about people who work 100 hours a week, the Corbys of the world. So all I have to do is think about them. And, um, and then there's candles and chocolate. Mm. So um, Chocolate. <laughs> you can't bring them into jails. But <laughs> And I'm getting ready to hit the road next week, and I'll be <laughs> in Southeast Asia for over three weeks. And I'm going to be staying in some you know, places that aren't that super comfortable. And you know, often I'm, I've got the malaria bed net and the, and the DEET all over me. And you know, you're sweating <laughs> buckets. And you've, you're living on cliff bars for a couple of weeks. But always bring a candle and dark chocolate. And, and share it with your teammates, because it just changes everything. So th that's how I recharge. Good fiction, too. Good fiction. Make it not real. It's wonderful what happens when it's not real. <laughs> Well, we're nearing the end of our formal program, and thank you all so much for being here with us. I think you're all here because you have some tie or tether to Harvard Divinity School, and I'm grateful that we had this time together because I think it's a good opportunity to remember that Harvard Divinity School is a place that sends out those vessels and transmitters into the world. It's a place that gives everyone who comes through the doors an orientation into the world through a lens of caring. It's a place that gives people eyes to see, opportunities to serve, ears to hear stories like that of Ruth and Guy and Muhammad and more. And I hope that as you've spent time here that you too have thought about whose stories you've heard, what stories you have a responsibility to tell, and where it is that you all are tethered to care and to serve in the world, um, one at a time, and lifting voices um, of those who you've encountered, and also offering the gift of presence, which I know all of you have and know about because of your connection to Harvard Divinity School. So Sejal and Suzanne, thank you so much. We can't, we can't thank you enough for sharing and for your generous opening up and the stories that you invited us all to participate in. 